So welcome everyone to uh, the Cyber Lecture. Um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce you to Rhea, to partner with Rhea. Um, he sort of uh, has crossed, I think, uh, some ten years ago when I actually uh, worked in the world. And um, I think it's very exciting uh, that Nikhil's here uh, from Rotterdam. Uh, in Los Angeles, um, because I think there's a kind of um, beautiful and ultimate culture clash between these two places, um, which, which is uh, fascinating in itself. In fact, I took the liberty of everyone's doing research these days, so I got a few statistics here. Um, so the population of the Netherlands is uh, 16 million, and Los Angeles is somewhere around. Uh, 10 million. Um, the Netherlands is, uh, the area of the Netherlands is 16,000 square miles, and the Los Angeles metro metropolitan region is about 10,000 square miles. Um, let's see, the life expectancy uh, in LA is 76, and it's 78 in, in Holland. Um, the um, highest elevation in California is about 6,000 meters, and the highest elevation in Holland is about 300 meters. And, um, oh yeah, this is important, the, the GDP of um, Southern California is $500 billion, and uh, for the Netherlands is $344 billion. And finally, uh, I did a little calculation on the number of architecture offices uh, per capita. And um, for LA County, it's about one, basically one office for every 12,000 people. And in Holland, you have uh, one office for every 7,000 people. And I think that's perhaps, uh, if my calculations properly, I'm actually surprised there's that many um, architecture offices. Uh, I would have thought it'd be more like one for 50,000 in LA. Um, so I think when, when you start thinking about architecture very explicitly, um, we all know that at the moment, uh, the, the European scene, and specifically uh, the Dutch condition now, is, is really a kind of incredible it's a mecca in terms of the work that's taking place, just the density of activity. And um, being in Los Angeles, and I think um, Every time we have a foreign visitor, um, I think it also forces us to confront our own situation here. And uh, so the kind of incredible dearth of activity in, in Los Angeles, and, and yet a similar scale between the places in certain terms, um, I think is very exciting in terms of really what, what is being accomplished uh, in Holland. Um, heals own story, and I, I don't know his life story, but I know a little bit. Um, which is also almost a kind of uh, fairy tale, somehow, uh, architecturally speaking. He um, more or less started his career by winning um, a competition for the European uh, Patent Office, or, or the Dutch Patent Office, which at the time was the biggest office building in the entire country. And uh, with his partners, they won this competition more or less just out of school. And um, so really, his, his, his professional career has started that time and sort of um, only gone up since then. And um, I know at this moment, uh, there's kind of incredible spectrum of work that is taking place um, in his office, everything from urban design to architecture. So, um, yeah, it's very exciting to have him here tonight. And um, thanks a lot and welcome. Thanks, Crystal, for this good introduction, because we didn't prepare this, but uh, there are other things that are, that are going to be addressed by me during this lecture. And I'll take the microphone off, because the spotlight is, is, is dreadful. <laughs> These two images are, are both in Rotterdam. They're both part of the, the Rotterdam. Atmosphere. And what is very important if you 
judge the work of Dutch architects or if you judge the work of the contemporary architectural condition in Holland, you always have to be aware of these two images, not necessarily as a projection position or not necessarily as a contrast, but as two extreme poles of the this, of this same thinking. So, um, let's say the two main extremes in terms of thinking are, uh, first of all, the fact that everything is man-made and everything is being engineered. So, whether you see this kind of wet green land, it's, it's being engineered, and whether you see uh, the, the fume stakes of the oil industry, the oil industry in Rotterdam, it's also being man-made. So, you have this kind of endless urbanized landscape with very different patches, very different kind of atmospheres within that, but still they're part of the same stream of thought. They're never uh, nature that ought to be conquered, they're never nature that's just being found, they're all just being made. So this is, let's say, the, the, one of the primal sources of the success of Dutch architecture, or the, let's say one of the primary reasons of existing of Dutch, Dutch architecture is the fact that we start with this existence of, of uh, uh, yeah, what do you call it? Uh, man, no, no, I'm not searching for the word man-made, but for another word, but I'll, I'll, I'll remind it later. That's a pity. So, both the cow and the grass and the urban highway are being manufactured, are being designed. And you can imagine this cow as being one of our famous uh, cloned cow, which has these cloned cow genes. And although everybody thinks it's human nature, it comes out of this test tube. At the same time, everybody is aware of the fact that that's being engineered. <laughs> the school I'm from, or the university I've been studying, is, is the Technical University of Delft. And the same comes for Delft. Delft is being founded uh, in the pre-Napoleonic time as a military school. So due to the fact that uh, the architectural profession was found in the military tradition, uh, there was always a large emphasis on analysis, a large emphasis on, of collecting data, a large emphasis on integration of functions. So, if you go back to the, the previous slides, and I don't know how we have If you go back to the previous slides, this kind of typical Dutch polar landscape is, is the mere existence of a military tradition because the, 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 the canals work as a waterway system to, to drain the water, the canals work as a dividing system to uh, divide the ownership, the canals work as a, a tool or as a main uh, line of transport. And this kind of thinking of integration of functions and this kind of uh, background of analysis and using NLA technical data to uh, organize the land, to organize architecture, is very important in, within our school and within our, within our way of thinking. So, I got two slides that were, in a way, for me, part of the Californian feeling. And I, I would like this, this slide project to be lowered. So, can you just move this? Okay, this is how, sir. So, what, you put, put a book under it or something. So, you have to imagine, I come from this kind of uh, engineered landscape, this engineered urban landscape with these 16 million inhabitants and these uh, 340 or 33 billion uh, cheap uh, national product. And we, uh, let's say, I have to go to California and I have to prepare a lecture. And there were two things that came up with me. The first thing was, 
uh, a story about Jim Clark, that's the founder of Netscape and Silicon Graphics, and recently the founder of the firm, a firm called My CFO. And next to it, uh, I came up with the Arts and Architecture magazine that uh, was, in a way, the commissioner for the famous case study houses in the 50s and late 40s. So, when I was thinking about the California tradition and I was thinking about the California condition, the only things that struck me were, th were these two. First of all, that there is kind of, there, there exists a kind of mentality in California to, to search for the new, new thing. And uh, so I don't know, and let's say I'm, I'm aware of the fact that you guys are not computer engineers, but uh, the, the title of this book was in a way striking for me, and was also in a way a reminder for me that in the 50s, uh, the Californian architects were, in a way, tapping directly from this new, new thing and were, in a way, directly in touch uh, with this new, new thing. And one of the questions uh, raised by Christoph in this uh, short introduction was whether uh, the Californian architectonical experience is still uh, in touch with this new new thing, uh, in the way Jim Clark is in touch with the new new thing. Why am, why am I emphasizing? Let's say why do I have, why do I ask your att attention for this point? Because in a way, architecture, in our opinion, at least in our opinion of our office, at least, should be about should be about kind of quest or a search for new prototypes, a search for new um, proposals for modern living and not necessarily modern living but also modern working, contemporary uh, learning conditions, contemporary urban conditions, contemporary uh, solutions for infrastructure and whatever kind of uh, challenges there are in the urban environment. So, what did what did what do I what did what did I bring from Rotterdam? Um, I brought, uh, let's say, a couple of projects. I brought at least ten projects uh, that show our attempt, or that show our attempt for uh, not necessarily the new new thing, but that show our attempt to create new solutions for a contemporary urban condition in terms of living, in terms of working, in terms of learning, uh, and in terms of recreation. We, as an office, work in three fields. We do housing, we do urban design, and we do larger public buildings. I didn't bring urban design due to the fact that, uh, in my opinion at least, um, urban design in, in this moment is so uncomparable to the Californian condition from my point of view that uh, the, the projects wouldn't be, uh, let's say, wouldn't add something to, to, to your body of knowledge. So I brought only a few housing projects and a lot of buildings. So I brought three housing projects, three kind of factory-like buildings, two fire stations, one university building, one office building, and two public, larger public buildings. And what I'm going to tell you is, this, the, let's say I'm going to try to explain you the points where we are searching for a kind of new element, not necessarily uh, a new prototype, but new elements, new possibilities of creating something else. And the elements are always in as, as the German call it, a neue, neue Kombination. So it's not an, a, a, an invention as, as such, but the combination could bring something new. The combination of existing knowledge, the combination of existing housing types, the combination of uh, existing uh, building uh, elements. So that, that is, let's say, one part of the train of thought. 
The other part is the fact that you have to <coughs> keep in mind that there, let's say, there are two main differences, or let's say maybe three main differences between the building practice here and the building practice in Europe. First of all, the cost of labor is three times as high in Europe than in, in uh, California. In a way, California is being flooded with this cheap labor from Latin America. Due to, the, due to that, the whole building industry never went through a kind of massive industrialization compared to the European practice. So whenever we have to work with contractors, you have to keep in mind that these contractors uh, depend a lot of industrialized building techniques. So that's maybe the first large difference, eh? the, the, the dependence of uh, manual labor in California and the dependence on uh, industrialized building techniques in, in Europe. The other main difference is of course the difference in climate. All buildings we've been making are, are meant for, for a climate where you have uh, temperature variations from minus 10 degrees below zero Celsius. How much is the environment? It's really cold. So it's really cold. <laughs> in Fahrenheit it's really cold. And um, up till 30 degrees or more Celsius in Fahrenheit it's really hot. <laughs> so that's the, the second given you have to be aware of. The third given you have to be aware of is uh, that due to very low budgets, um, so all the buildings are being uh, made for rather strict and low budgets, so due to that we are always forced to integrate functions. So we're always forced to use uh, certain building parts for different functions as well. I'm going to show you a building where we use the concrete and the rainwater system to avoid air conditioning. So instead of making this kind of obvious Californian solution of air conditioning, we, we, we're trying to use rainwater in order to, to uh, uh, ventilate away the, the heat. Um, so integration is a kind of uh, other aspect in all our work. The last thing I, I would like to mention, and maybe that's uh, a thing that, that is also being uh, that's rather rather uh, important at this stage in California. I read in the newspaper yesterday after we arrived that the, the energy prices uh, will be increased with uh, 46 percent, but still then the energy price is lower. Uh, or, or at least more than 50% lower than the energy price in the Netherlands. So the third thing we, I ought to emphasis in all projects is a kind of emphasis on sustainability and not sustainability as a kind of uh, search or quest for solar panels on the roof but or, or eating more yogurt. But <laughs> <laughs> sustainability as, a, as an attitude, as a kind of fundamental attitude in the way you design and the way you perceive the build, and build environment. Okay, so this was a very long introduction. I have two more slides to come up before we start uh, with the project. So when I talk about integration, when I talk about uh, sustainability and when I talk about uh, different aspects of architecture for, for me this is a kind of field we all architects have to work with on the one hand we have the so-called intelligent houses as designed by contractors and uh, as designed by the building industry on the other hand we have uh, the kind of famous Albert Fry image for a building in uh, Palm Springs where um, where um, this kind of huge rock is, is hovering above, uh, above the bed and at the same time if, if you look carefully there 
at the same time, if you look carefully, the, the air conditioning switch is being integrated into, into this rock. <laughs> here, 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 it, it's really, and this is pathetic in a way. <laughs> although, although it's a very nice scheme by, by uh, Albert Fry, it's his it's kind of private house in Palm Springs. It's at the same time, it's pathetic due to the fact that he had this rock uh, that could be a kind of cooling device, but still he doesn't use it as, as a cooling device, but he uses this. He immaculately uh, takes out all the concrete or so all the rock and integrates the, the air conditioning switch. But in a way, it's, it's as, as ludicrous as, as the neighbors, of course, because Again, apparently an intelligent house, or apparently in, in, in the vision of, of the larger public body, an intelligent house, hence intelligent architecture, is whether your light switch is being integrated or whether your refrigerator is being connected to the computer. And this is kind of intelligence uh, Bill Gates' house is being uh, searching for, but it hasn't to do anything with real kind of fundamental issues that ought to be addressed by uh, professionals uh, as we are. So, let's say our, our quest is somewhere in, in between these two uh, extremes, as, as the same time as our quest is somewhere in between the, the, the cows, the gene genetic manipulated cows in the green meadows and uh, uh, oil industry of Venice. Uh, okay, this is really old work uh, in that sense that after we won this large competition, as, as Christophe already mentioned, we, we did a few housing schemes because this very large commission never uh, uh, succeeded in that sense that uh, we only did a schematic design. Afterwards, we did a lot of other competitions in order to get something built. So I, I, I'm going to show you three projects now. They're all housing, and they were all the result of a competition. And uh, they're all, in a way, similar to us, because they, have, they address similar issues, they address similar typological questions, and in a way, they also address the kind of main themes in our work. And if I would like to summarize these, these three projects, you could say that the search in these three projects was a kind of search for a new living quality, uh, not necessarily, uh, as I already told, in a larger refrigerator or a, a computerized a light switch, but fundamentally searching for a new housing type. This, this one is, in a way, the forerunner of the two other projects and it's, um, it's, it, there are detached houses on the, on the, on the Hoimeer. The Hoimeer is a kind of uh, part of the larger estuary in the middle of the Holland uh, called Eisenmeer. And what we did, the commission asked for uh, houses on a six meter plot and that were just uh, mechanically and did it uh, mechanically uh, laid out over the site. Um, due, all, due to all kinds of uh, bis, uh, due to all kinds of uh, budget constraints, we in a way had to stick to this six meter plot. But we thought, if you have this kind of incredible view over this lake in front of you, and if you have the, the, the southern side as, as being the sunny side in the back of you, you should in a way develop a stretch type instead of the typical kind of uh, detached house with with an entrance below and, and just uh, three levels on top of that. So what we designed was kind of merger of the typical row house that is one goes over one plot and an apartment building that goes over several plots. So what we did, we merged the two plots and we gave every dwelling a large living room overlooking the uh, and at the same time catching up the sun with somebody. In fact, so you 
with the entrances here, carport, and then either dwelling as some as, as this, this L shape, uh, as a, with a large living room, or as a kind of small tower with with services and sleeping rooms uh, at the back side. So this one is here, and the other one is there, so it has this L shape, and the two dwellings are overlapping. And it's a very simple, it's a very simple strategy, you see it here, but at the same time, you're, you're very, without altering the, all the budget constraints, you're adding such an extra value, and you're, you're in a way enjoying uh, almost 14 meters of uh, view over this uh, inner lake. This um, this building or this uh, housing complex uses a similar strategy, although on a more dense and a more urban scale. This is a project we did in the Borneo Sporkenburg scheme by Adrian Beuze, and what we were trying to search for was again a living topo or a topology to live in that added value or that added in a way quality that was different from the normal um, pile of houses on top of each other. So what did we do? We created a set of gardens, both roof gardens or kind of large front balconies, always on top of the house of your neighbor. Um, on street you enter through a carport as, as if you're in Venice, uh, Venice, California. <laughs> And then you, you rise into your own internal staircase, either in this apartment with, with the uh, roof terrace adjacent to it, or in the lower apartment. Again, um, a house that develops over two bays and faces the southern sun. And see here, uh, this is actually not a very interesting slide. So you get the carports there, and then you have the staircases, and you go up internally. to these double bay living rooms with your own sleeping rooms and your own bathroom and your own sink is behind it or you go further up to your roof terrace with your own privacy and your own your own world with a kitchen and an internal staircase behind it. And it looks more or less like this. So this is another housing project. This is as, as this is real. This is social housing for uh, uh, people really low-income housing. Um, and again, we used the, the, the strategy of having very small base, a series of endless small base, and creating a kind of maisonettes, so double-layer apartments below, and having on top of that a new grade and every, every house that's on top of this new grade has either a roof garden in front of his house or a roof garden on top of the neighbors and all these gardens have different shapes and layouts and different orientations and due to that you give them a quality and in a way atmosphere that's very distinct and very different from the usual quality of social housing. So, let me see where I can explain it. So, here you see all these terraces, either a, a, a small terrace in front of your house and then a double bay living room or a long stretched private garden um, between the building or be between the houses. On the lower level, you get this endless base of, of living rooms and uh, overlooking, oh, I didn't explain that actually, sorry. One of the main things of this project, <laughs> I forgot to mention the main trick of the project, was the fact that we created an inner garden. Um, and it's not an in, a garden as such, but a real inner green. So you have a, a, a large gate and you enter up after this gate in a communal middle area. Uh, at the end of the middle area, there's now a large uh, daycare center for, for small children that 
give a kind of programmatic quality to this middle area. At the same time, everybody enters through this communal green into his own private patio or his own private front garden and, raise, and enters from that into his house. So every house, whether you're living there, is kind of uh, direct access to this middle green, but also doesn't have the problem of shared uh, stairwells, uh, shared uh, elevators, let's say all the typical problems of uh, social housing that are being avoided by the fact that everybody has this own private front door, whether, whether they're living upstairs or whether they're living in the two apartments below. So, how could I forget that, huh? <laughs> uh, so this is the, the kindergarten. It's the riverside view, and so you see all these different gardens and different uh, private domains. So we took part of this slide because this is well during execution, so it was quite quite a mess on this slide. <laughs> So here you see all the entrance porches with the, their own bell, their own front door, their own bench on the green. Here you see the, the, the riverside with um, the, the, what do you call it, the parking below. Everybody has his own parking space below his house. And then on top of that, your own private garden facing the river. This is street view. This is the internal, the internal green with the kindergarten at the end. So this is the real garden of the kindergarten. It's in a real view. So as a strategy, the, the projects are very similar. There are only a few alternations in base size. So this last project is the smallest base size because, in fact, they are the smallest dwellings. The, the, the middle project has a little bit of larger base size, and the, the, the last or the first project had, had the widest base size. So only by adapting both the base size and the depth of the dwelling, you are able to modify the density of a project, but you are also able to modify the way the project appears and the way the project relates to the uh, either the communal ground or the public area, the public domain as such. Um, you can imagine, in this case, you had all these doors lining up as, as the border of the public domain. In the Borneo Sporum, we had all these car parks lining up as the border of the public domain. And by doing so, you're always able to address another quality and you're always able to address another way of living uh, when you're uh, designing a complex of this scale. This is in a way an exception in, in our work. It's uh, also a husband project, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a tower. We, we designed two housing towers and one is already eight years ago. It still isn't executed. This one was designed six years ago and it's, really, it's already executed. We call it in a way always an exception because on a typological level, in a tower there is not much to be invented. Huh? You can imagine you have the core with the, with the elevators and the emergency staircases and around that you, you organize your buildings. Um, the thing we did invent was the fact that we, we in, in a kind of developer-driven market, you have always the, the cliché of the rooftop apartments. Yeah? The, the, these apartments are always the, the luscious, the nicest apartments. So we thought, how could we overcome this cliché? Um, due to the fact that this was a, a competition done with the developer. So we introduced all kinds of cuts and pockets within this volume. And 
we organized within these cuts and pockets all the special types. So instead of having the types on top of the building, we integrated them within the volume. All these pockets were in a way responding to uh, either views in the larger urban site or were responding to um, functions or sorry, views and, and, and uh, sight lines that corresponded with the position of the tower. Uh, here you see, in a way, what I've already said to you. So you have the core, and due to the fact that we combined all surfaces around the core, we had a kind of zone with uh, free space. So this space could be molded, this space could be cut away from the volume, this space could be altered. So due to the fact that you have all your surfaces and as such in the middle of it, you can do whatever you want within this zone. So by doing so, we were able to create a lot of different types organized around a pocket or with an internal staircase and hence creating within this tower different ways of life and different ways of living. And because maybe I haven't mentioned it, but one of the things where we're searching for different ways of living is the fact that you ought to respond or you ought to answer a kind of growing demand for heterogeneity within society. So instead of just producing an endless row of similar types, you also should address the fact or you should address the the modern society that people aren't living anymore with the 2.6 kids uh, so you have a father and a mother and you have 2.4 kids and uh, 1.6 cars and you live in an apartment of this size so due to the fact that luckily the society altered you also should be aware of the fact as an architect that you should provide also different ways of living within your design. So this is, this is the result. And another thing, well, another feature within this building is that we were trying to suppress the articulation of the different dwelling. So we gave every house and every function a similar window and we wrapped this window around around the volume and by doing so the building didn't didn't appear as a, as a pile of, of, of apartment units on top, on top of each other but it starts to work on the scale of the larger urban environment so I'm going to show you now three uh, working buildings. One is a post office, the second one is a um, printing factory, or uh, maybe, maybe the second one is a, is a building for uh, a service building for the state. But uh, I'll, show you. <laughs> I'll show you anyhow. There are a lot of similarities between the three buildings in that sense that they all they all have to deal with a, a large internal clearance. They have to deal with a large, uh, larger internal program, and due to that, we were searching for a specific building technique in either project. So I'll, I'll, I'll address that question afterwards. Um, this one was a post office in Scherpenheuvel, that's Belgium. And Scherpenheuvel is one of the sites where Maria has been seen um, in Europe. And you've got some famous pilgrimage site in Portugal or in Spain. And this is the famous pilgrimage site in the northern part of Europe. And due to the fact that Maria appeared in a kind of cage, we thought, yeah, let's make a cage for all these pilgrims who went there and have to post, have to deliver their postcard. And, and so we, we made, in a way, we, in a way we, we made this cage where all these pilgrims uh, bring, bring their postcard. Mm -hmm. When we went to the site, there was already a building there that was a kind of prototypical rural post office. There was a grocery in it, and we thought, yeah, yeah, this, 
just keep it. Let, let's keep the building and, and renovate it and we put all the um, ancillary functions in it, like uh, the locker room of the postman, the, the eating room of the postman, the offices, the vault, all these kind of things are, are being kept in, in the existing building. Behind that, we created a large distribution, a, a regional distribution area. So it has a, a large internal uh, clearance. It is a free span of 17 times 17 meters. And we created this kind of artificial hill where the postmen are being housed under. So this is the internal post office, this is the external post office where you can buy stamps and do uh, and, and, and deliver your uh, postcard. Here you see the postman. <laughs> so how, how did we do that? I already emphasized the fact that all our work is in a way very pragmatic and direct related to building practice. So, due to the fact that we wanted to create this kind of large bluish uh, sky uh, as, as a reference to, to, to uh, Virgin Mary uh, appearing in this cage, we, we, we created a large Belgian waffle. <laughs> So, if, if you have to span 17 times 17 meters, you need a lot of concrete and a lot of reinforcement. But we created this Belgian waffle with uh, these kind of uh, candle lights uh, in it. Uh, and the, these elements are to, are, are have two functions. They're, they're there to reduce the, the load, they're there to reduce the heaviness of this concrete uh, plate. At the same time, they bring in natural light or artificial light into the large hole. And they also are um, the grills for the air handling. So these, these elements are the grill for the air handling or the grills for the um, acoustical insulation. So in order to be able to make this large 17 times 17 meter span, we, we literally translated the Belgian waffle into concrete. Yeah, and so by, inter by integrating different concepts and by integrating different ideas, you were able to uh, get something new. So as, a, as an urban gesture, at night, the, the, the post is being sorted out and distributed and being prepared to send out of the country. And if you, you're going, you're driving through this kind of village street, you're always aware of the fact that the postmen take care of your post. <laughs> this, this is a printing factory we've been making, and this was on a, a rather grim and industrial site. Um, so we, we thought of reusing the typical Roman villa. As you know, the ancient Roman villa with a kind of impluvium patio in the middle of it, it has a kind of interesting uh, spatial effect that everything is being focused on the center. Due to the fact that the industrial side for this uh, printing factory was rather grim for Dutch, uh, let's say, Dutch standards. And so we, we thought of uh, introducing this patio where everybody is look, being looking, where everybody is looking on and gives a kind of communal focus. At the same time, we were in a way able to overcome the very sharp and distinct uh, division between blue-collar workers and, and white-collar workers. Traditionally, traditionally, there's a very strong distinction between these two people, people with ink on their hands and people without ink on their hands. So we thought that was a thing to be not necessarily adjusted, but a thing to be addressed. So here, here you get this kind of communal garden. Uh, you have the canteen looking to the garden. You get offices looking into the garden and you get the large factory hall looking into the garden. So you always have this kind of brownish, 
fire stove in the heart of the building, bringing light wherever you are. Here again, we try to integrate different functions. These large columns are both load bearing and part of the air handling, the air handling of the machines. So these elements, you, they run through, they run uh, up to the roof. They, 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 they support the roof. At the same time, the air is being pushed into these columns, and the air is being filtered through the columns into the uh, working hall. So again, by integrating different elements of the building practice, we are able to get a kind of new quality because due to the fact that the air streams through these columns you get a very uh, homogeneous uh, vaporization in the air of the working element in the working hall and due to that you get a higher printing quality. Um, this is a very famous Dutch poet, it's called Mr. K. Schippers. Uh, when we are thinking about the design of the facade, we were in a, in a way struck by a dilemma because we created this almost enclosed exterior the facade. At the same time, we, we thought it was outrageous to, to, to present the building only with steel cladding. So we asked the poem to write a poem for the, for the building and the poem is being silk screened on, on glass plates, just normal float glass, and this glass is being put with uh, very simple greenhouse millions onto the facade. So here you see the result, and if you look carefully, you can read. If you if you read Dutch, you can read words. Of, <laughs> you read words of the poem. So this is the last industrial building I'm going to show you. Again, it's similar to the previous one. It again has a is very, uh, let's say, it has a sequence in height and it has a sequence in kind of uh, working environments. It has a small interior patio where this element pops out, but due to the function and due to its internal logic, it's also completely different. It's a building, a service building for uh, the Ministry of Rijkswaterstaat. So that's the ministry that maintains roads and waterways and canals. And if there's a calamity on the sea or on the, on the Wadersee in this case, or a calamity on the road or they have to, to, to uh, uh, put uh, salt on the road when it's freezing, every truck or every ship leaves this building. So hence the building is being divided into three parts. A large salt storage, a kind of middle zone with workshops in the middle and an office zone in front of it where, where everything is being organized. This, this zoning also is in compliance with the zoning in terms of climate or zoning in terms of interior uh, conditions. So this has a kind of high quality interior condition. This has a kind of more rough interior condition due to the fact that these loading doors ought to be opened. And this is completely external. So by zoning the building in this way, we were able to uh, create a kind of low energy building due to the fact that these two, build, these two uh, elements protect the lower element, element for a large so-called wind attack, the, the, the cold winter wind ought to be uh, ought to be shut up from the office space. So, hence, by by organizing or by zoning the building in such a way, we were able to create a kind of good uh, living environment, although it's you know, on a rather uh, windy and stormy site. Uh, to be, actually, it's too bad that you that you can't see this one now, but this one is similar. <laughs> uh, this one is good. It's a kind of stealth bomber, because you, you have to imagine, due to the fact that it's a large heap of salt in, in, in this part of the building, 
you have to be able to enter with large bulldozers into the building there. And so this is, has a very large internal clearance. This, this clearance is also very high, and due to that, you get this very strong wedge uh, shape appearance. It, the building is black to have a nice contrast with the, with the boats of the Zwartestown. And with the, with the large devices uh, they have. So again, you, if you imagine a large, a large truck, a large truck can stand below this, below this machinery. Eh? So the truck drives under this machinery, and the machinery is being hoisted upon the truck. So you have to imagine that in order to get a feeling for the scale. Okay, this is a building we've been realizing three three years ago. Um, in a way, the building addresses a lot of issues that are already being addressed in, in the previous projects. So uh, there, there, there are three things to be mentioned about this building. Um, the, first of all, the integration of functions. The building has kind of a centerpiece where a large pond is being integrated in the main hall of the building, and this uh, this basin works as a, a cooling device. So all the rainwater is being collected in the heart of the building, and all the laboratories below this basin are being cooled with the rainwater. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it's being made with a lot of uh, industrial elements. So I uh, can show you uh, a lot of industrial components that just make this building in order to, to get it built. The, the third thing is that, in a way, this building is about all the senses. So not only your eyes, but also about smell, about tactility, about noise, about everything. Uh, the five senses we also, we always, in a way, use. And, and that's an issue that, that maybe ought to be addressed specifically because our architectonical profession tends to address the eyes only. And one of the main features of, of good architecture, maybe, could be the fact that you also address the ears or you address the nose or you address your fingertips as well. And this building is really focusing on the five senses in that sense, but all the forthcoming slides ought to be imagined, ought to be imagined with your ears or ought to be imagined with your nose and all go into it. So this is how it works. I already mentioned that. You've got the main hall and the main hall is above the laboratories and the laboratories are being cooled by the, by the water. At the end of the main hall you have staircases going up into the auditoriums or you, you go into a large restaurant or you go down from, uh, from the main hall into the laboratories. The third element, not yet mentioned by me, is the element about the net growth ratio of this building. The Ministry of Educational Affairs wrote a brief, wrote, wrote a space requirements with a certain net growth ratio and while we were writing the brief they imagined a building with a middle corridor, or classrooms or laboratories on either side of this corridor. So the, the building had a certain amount of corridors envisioned in the brief already. But we, in a way, we took out all these corridors and we put all these corridors in this main hall. And we avoided corridors in the laboratory level due to the fact that you always enter by stair directly into laboratories. So all the space that was originally, originally dedicated for corridors are being put together into this main hall. The, the striking thing about that was that the uh, while writing the brief, the client didn't give any specifications for the internal climate of the corridors. So normally you get uh, internal specifications about the heat, about the noise level, about the 
uh, humidity level, etc. But due to the fact that the, the, while writing the space specifications, uh, they envisioned this corridor already. Due to that, they thought that the corridor would have, or that this area within the brief, would have a certain interior climate. But due to the fact that we combined all the space into this main hall, we could give it whatever climate we wanted to give it because the client never formulated uh, the climate in advance. So, by having this trick, or by inventing this trick, we could open up the space to, to the roof and the rain literally drips into the space and the rain falls into the spot. In winter, uh, the shutters uh, close a little bit, the rain of course still has to come into the, the basin, but uh, the, the temperature comes as down as something like 14 degrees Celsius, that is you need, you need a winter coat then, it's not really cold, but a bit, a bit cold. <laughs> uh, but uh, in summer the, 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 the temperature rises also higher than a normal classroom temperature. It's more in compliance with the other exterior climate. So here you see this kind of roof of the building, completely, in a way, made out of standard bridge elements. So highways or bridges on highways are being composed or being made with these kind of elements. You see kind of prefabricated concrete gutters or, or, or canals where the rainwater is still in. Then the rainwater comes into these cavities and then falls falls into a main hall. So now you, you, you see this kind of fancy slide and at the same time you ought to imagine that it's noisy in this, in this main hall. Eh? So you, you, should, you should be aware of the fact that you have, when it's raining, this kind of tremendous noise, falling, tremendous noise, all this water falling into this pond. In order to compensate both the noise and the rather humid, uh, temperature in, in, this, in this space. We created these cubicles. They're clamped with velvet and we're red velvet and there's a small stove below the table. So when it's, whenever it's winter or whenever it's cold, uh, the people who are preparing their lessons or the students eating their lunch uh, warm themselves around this stove and have this kind of very intimate acoustical climate directly adjacent to this very noisy and harsh acoustical climate of this, this hall. Either you go down by stairs or you go up into the laboratories, there's again the, the, the rainwater basin. You have a lot of laboratories, these are the cooling systems, or the cooling ceilings where the rainwater is being pumped through. This is large learning center with, with, again, although it has a lot of stone finishing, again, a very intimate, inti intimate and delicate acoustical climate. And here you have the restaurant with a harsh uh, acoustical climate, as if it's a French cafe. Again, you see the columns in this case, the, the columns aren't load bearing, but the columns are a kind of light lanterns, bringing light into the space, and in the lower level, they bring air, uh, ventilation air into the space, and in the middle part, they provide acoustical insulation. The red bench, this is kind of a huge red, red bench at the end of the space, is also a, a device to sit on, of course, but it's also a large acoustical panel. So again, by using elements that you ought to accommodate, you, you need ventilation air, you need material for acoustical insulation. By integrating that into your tectonical design, you get something else or you get something that is maybe uh, different from, from uh, the usual school building. So this is the exterior. So we, we, we thought for, we were searching for uh, an element that would give, that would give uh, the building a touch 
of the interior, like the poem on the printing factory, where, where the letters in a way show what's happening inside. We thought of a kind of red rock. The, the, this is the department of geophysics of the building of the University of Utrecht. So, due to the fact that also the department of geophysics is being housed in this building, we were searching for an element that could express that. So we used a technique from uh, the civil engineering. It's, it's, it's called spray concrete. And um, civil engineers make sluices with that or, or the, the, the finishing of a canal. We use it as a finishing of the facade and you get this kind of tectonic a layering as if it's a very old ancient rock. In fact, the building isn't shifted, but it, could, it continues there. <laughs> uh, another element are these kind of large, uh, strange uh, worms on, on the skin. We were searching for an element that could express another scale difference. So, if you, in all our projects, and, and I'll, I'll point it out in our project as well, in all our projects we are searching for three levels of intervention while designing a facade. The first level is, the, let's say, the, the level of the, the exterior silhouette, or the, the, the shape as such, and the, the, the volume. The second level is let's say, the, the fenestration, or the, the position where you put your windows. And the third level is a kind of ornamental level even, uh, where you address another scale. So the, the volume addresses the scale of the urban or the public domain, and the window addresses, let's say, the, the scale of the interior, and the, the, the worms or the, the ornaments address the scale that mediates between this larger silhouette scale and the scale of the window. So I'm going to show you now two fire stations. Um, and I, I brought these fire stations because they're again, in a way, tapping back to this uh, search for um, uh, analysis and the search for the search for a pr pragmatic answer to the demands of the client. The, both the fire stations are more or less similar in size, more or less similar in uh, area, but they're completely different due to the fact that both commanders had a different wish. This commander wanted to have this kind of usual uh, fire station layout with the trucks, all the trucks with a door opening up to the street and service bay behind that with the workshops and, and the security uh, equipment, then the offices and the sleeping quarters in, in the back. It's the kind of typical fire station section. Yeah? As if you're designing a, a car, uh, how do you call it? A, a car saloon? No, you don't call it that way. <laughs> Um, a building where they sell cars. Yeah? You also always have this kind of... Uh, dealership. Okay, the dealership, you always have this kind of large bay window where they have, they have all these new BMWs lined up. Um, so, in a way, this is the kind of dealership section where you have all the trucks uh, in front of the street and then all the services behind. The Making a fire station making a fire station in a way um, forces you to address the function of, of the fire brigade and it's a, a very strange function in that sense that the, the so-called 24-hour brigade is always waiting for a disaster and it's a very strange attitude to, to, to work in. So they, they Apparently they do nothing all day, but in fact <laughs> they, they just polish their cars and they do their exercises. But in fact they're just waiting for a disaster. And that's, that is very important to notice because that is also has a very traumatic side in it. In that sense that, that people 
have to leave the, the fire station within one minute, whether it's day or night, whether it's winter or summer, <coughs> being dressed up, have, having their boots on, their, their, their security jackets, leave, leave the station and they come into kind of a total inferno of car incidents or, or, or uh, larger fires. So we, in both the fire stations, we search a kind of we were searching for a kind of space that would compensate this kind of traumatic uh, given, and we, we gave the firemen large outdoor spaces, kind of spaces for contemplation with inner ponds um, or a larger roof garden. You will see that in the, in the forthcoming project as well. Um, this pond is again an element of sustainability in that sense that the larger element, the larger pond works as a rainwater collector and all the trucks leave the fire station filled with rainwater in order to do the first uh, actions when they're on site. So again this building has this element of uh, ornamentation in that sense that we, this building is being built in an incredible uh, short time. It's being executed in, in less than 10 months due to the fact that the building was completely prefabricated. As I already mentioned, uh, labor is, is rather expensive in Europe compared to California and due to that the whole building was being prefabricated. So it consists of load-bearing insulated concrete panels and it's been hoisted on site and bolted into each other and then it was finished. So both the exterior finish and the interior finish and the windows and the millions were already assembled in the factory. We, we uh, gave the building a kind of decoration of truck tires. You see it here, you see it there. As if the fire trucks were running over the facade while it, is being, while it was being poured in the concrete factory. In the heart of the building there is a large void and there are kind of strange uh, red balconies hanging, hanging in this void. And these are the living, the so-called living room of the fire, firemen. They have, you have the sleeping rooms and the living room. And directly from these living rooms you have the sliding poles going down into the maintenance bay going down into the bay of the cars. On this side, you you always have through this some internal void, you have always kind of diagonals, either looking into the sleeping quarters, or looking into the service bay, or looking to, into the offices, or looking into the internal garden. So here you have the internal garden, here if you, you have the internal garden again, here below you have windows opening up into the service bay. Behind the balcony you have the offices. Below the balcony you have the sleeping rooms. And all the functions are being, are, are being connected spatially due to this open middle area. So this is the dealer. What was it? <laughs> the, dealer uh, the dealership, right? Yeah, the, the, the Mercedes truck showroom. Okay, this is, this is the other fire brigade. And due to the fact that the commander had a different wish uh, about the organization of his truck and about his first so-called uh, about his so-called first wave of attack. So he had another vision about his so-called first wave of attack, and due to that he, he demanded a, another organization of the fire trucks. This is the so-called Le Mans um, organization. You have the famous 24 hours, 24 hour race of Le Mans. Um, that's a, a, a city in France. And all the, the racing cars are always being organized diagonally and due to that the inner street always stays open so if there is a calamity either uh, on the roads or, or, or if there's a car accident they use a certain amount of trucks and if there is a fire accident they use another amount of trucks and if there's a kind of uh, accident in, in a chemical plant they use again another uh, layout of trucks. So, due to this inner street, it always stays open. 
they can leave the fire station with the truck that's completely behind, if necessary. So that was a kind of very explicit wish of this command. So we got a completely different arrangement of the of the surface bay adjacent to the to the trucks, uh, a different arrangement of the sporting fields, and a different arrangement of the exercise courts. On top of the the, the surface bay, you got the, the rooms with the firemen around uh, roof gardens uh, on top of the on, on top of the lower building, and you got a large surface building with a restaurant and a learning center in it, hovering above a large pool uh, where again rainwater is being collected. This building has a, another feature. Uh, and it also has again to do with building the, the fire station. The, this building is conceived as in a steel structure, so all you people are, are in the States are more or less aware of the complexity of building with a, with a steel structure. And one of the complexities is the fact that you ought to have very good fireproofing. Uh, in this case, um, the, the, all the load-bearing elements of the steel structure are filled with water. So if there is a, a fire in the fire station, the, the structural elements are being cooled with water. And due to that, you can build a building with exposed steel trusses without fireproofing, because the fireproofing is being organized internally. And again, we have a large pond. Uh, where you, and in this pond is the rainwater being collected, and if you're entering the, the, the uh, fire station when you're not a fireman, you have to go over this pond. And in this pond you get a, a vapor of rainwater coming out of the steel uh, columns. And you, you have to go through this vapor of water in order to enter the building. Above that you have a large balcony overlooking the city, where the firemen can have their lunch in, in during summer. This slide shows, in a way, another aspect of, of this uh, fire station. Again, we were searching for a kind of scale element that could mediate with the larger scale of the volume and the smaller scale of the window. And we took bricks, and normally bricks are being made in a formwork, and the formwork has, has this cavity in it, because you have to put the mortar in it when you're, you're piling up the bricks. So by, by putting the, the bricks instead of so we put it upside or not upside down, you put it sideways, you, you, you get this expression of the, the cavities. Normally you don't see the cavities because they're, they're just piled up in the wall. Uh, again, you, you have a kind of element that uh, in a way softens the, the expression of the whole building. This haystack, this large haystack, is the living room of the firemen. So if, if there's a calamity, you, all these windows have a different color. And if there's a calamity, the windows start to glow, and this whole space, the whole color of this space turns either red or blue or green, depending on the nature or the size of the, of the disaster. The, the firemen have, have this bridge, and this bridge goes down into a bay with, with, with uh, sliding poles, and the sliding poles come down into the uh, large uh, bay with the cars. The bridge cross, doesn't cross uh, the, the office corridor because there's this very strong distinction not between the blue collar workers and the white collar workers, but there's a very strong distinction between the 24 hour brigade, the, the, let's say the, the the heroes waiting for a disaster and, and the office uh, staff. And when there's a disaster, they don't want to interfere with the office staff, so they don't cross this corridor, but they just bridge this corridor and go directly into the bay with the cars. This is the, the conference room of the command overlooking the city and checking out whether there's a fire or not. 
So we, do, we have just one working building left, and then we, we switch to two public buildings, and then we're almost finished. I only have a conclusion then. <laughs> Or maybe I will skip the conclusion and I'll leave the conclusion to you guys. Um, good. This is a building we made for the National Airport, Schiphol. And it was a building on a rather grim site. You have to imagine Schiphol as an incredible high noise level. Maybe not as high as Los Angeles International Airport, but a very high noise level for Dutch standards. Secondly, the, the, the air is being polluted with a very small vapor of uh, kerosene, uh, the, the, the gas that's been used by uh, plants. So, in fact, the, the, the airport asked us an almost impossible commission to, to build a workspace directly adjacent to one of the runways. The building is really directly adjacent to the runways due to the fact that um, all people from customs or from uh, freight forwarders, trading companies, let me say forwarders, uh, have to be directly to the to the loading area of these uh, cargo planes. So what did we do? We we made a building that actually consists out of three or maybe even out of two elements. That is a kind of standard, let's say, typical office building. And we put a large glass jar over it, and a way the jar mediates between the harsher exterior climate and the more friendly interior climate. So, due to the fact that we put this jar over over the building, uh, you had you you could keep out the, the kerosene vapor, you could keep out this high noise, level, high noise level, and at the same time you could create internal pockets that could have uh, a climate that was more in compliance with Mediterranean France, eh? Saint-Tropez, Nice, instead of uh, Schiphol. <laughs> so here, here you see the kind of concept models. So here you see what, what is, what is, let's say, after execution. It's still red, huh? the front of the wall. <laughs> so you have large interior gardens, and, and the, 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 the green doesn't look very convincing yet, but... <laughs> so you have these large internal pockets, and all the people, all the offices open up to these internal pockets, and you have the smell of olive trees, or of... Um, uh, what is it? <laughs> I don't know the word in English. Um, while working there, and at the same time, you're working in the direct vicinity of the runway. So here they are, you have all of trees, and I don't know this in, in English. So here you see how it works. You have this kind of large cavity between the red building and the glass jar, and this cavity, there's the, the glass is being suspended with a kind of forest of needles to keep the glass jar on the right distance. And, and above and below you have kind of ventilation devices that could be altered in respect to the wind direction or um, that could be altered in order to accommodate the different seasons. So you can imagine that if it's winter you want to shut off the shutters in order to keep the warm air inside, and let's say that this glass house warms up during the day. In the mid-seasons, you want to be able to adjust the shutters in order to, depending on the, 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 the nature of the day. During summer, you can open up the shutters either at night to cool, cool off the building at night, you, you, so you're using the so-called night ventilation. Or you, uh, yeah, you, you open them up during the day and then uh, depending on the wind direction you close off either side in order to keep the noise, the noise, the noise out. So, the last two projects are being realized, they're in the design phase still. The first is a museum, a competition for a museum in Antwerp, we won recently. Uh, I don't know whether this is going to be executed, but it's, well, we're working on it now.